Jean Piaget is perhaps the most famous developmental researcher. His cognitive theory of development has been cited an uncountable number of times at this point. I have no idea how many people have cited his research. And you can find it in any textbook on psychology. It's pretty much like a universally understood theory. And it's actually a pretty simple theory. It only has four stages. So he was another stage theorist, similar to Freud and similar to Erickson. But I would argue that by far, his research has been the most influential. We're going to be talking a lot about his research throughout the semester. Now, uh, Piaget's entire idea is that, uh, according to his theory, he argued that all children pass through a set series of four stages during their cognitive development. The sensory motor stage, the pre-operational stage, the concrete operational stage, and the formal operational stage. And during each stage, different abilities and different cognitive skills begin to develop. So that first stage, the sensory motor stage, he calls it sensory motor because that's the focus of the stage. You know, children between the age of zero to two, they're not really talking that much and they're not really thinking about the world in very abstract ways. They're just trying to understand the world through their senses and then interact with it in a meaningful way with their muscles. So that's exactly why it's called the sensory motor stage. You know, sensory input and motor responses become increasingly coordinated during these first two years. Most intellectual development is nonverbal. I understand some kids do start to speak during this early stage of life. It's just not very common. And there's a few interesting things that have been verified by scientific studies, such as infants generally cannot create internal mental representations. They cannot think about the world that's not right in front of their face. They, they lack what we call object permanence. So object permanence is this ability to understand that objects will continue to exist even if they're out of sight. So this is something you can test if you uh, live with you know one of these individuals between the age of zero to two, like if you have your own child or if you want to go do a little experiment on your neighbor's child or something, just get permission first. But this is something you could test. You could take one of their favorite toys, you know, put it right in front of their face, make sure it is something they actually want. You know, they might try to reach for it because they're coordinating their senses and muscles, like I was saying. And then just put it like away, put it somewhere nearby, but somewhere they can't see. Now, if the child continues to try to find it, then hey, they understand it still exists. You know, they, they have learned this object permanence. But if the child is very young, you know, closer to zero than two, then they'll probably just immediately forget about it. It's like that toy is gone. It's never coming back. It never even existed. It's just vanished from existence. So that's an interesting little experiment you can do. But if you are a parent, then you probably have already seen this happen in your own life. Like maybe you put your infant down, infant was perfectly happy hanging out with you, but you put them down because you had to go in the other room to change the laundry or something. As soon as you go around the corner and they can't see you, they just burst into tears. It's like daddy has ceased to exist because he went around the corner. And then when you come back again, suddenly you've popped back into existence. Like it's a surprising event for them. They just don't understand how this kind of stuff works. You're like a wizard. This is perhaps why playing peekaboo with a very young child is so satisfying for them. You are like a wizard in that case. Like you're vanishing from existence and popping back in again suddenly. It can be pretty amazing if you think about it that way. But an, an interesting consequence to this lack of object permanence and lack of ability to create an internal mental world is that kids... Uh, very young kids generally don't really have dreams, so to say. Not like adults do. And they also don't tend to show any fear of the dark. Because remember, 
if they can't see it, if it's not something that they can sense, then it doesn't exist, right? So if you put a very young child in a completely dark room, they generally show no signs of fear. They're only going to be afraid if they see something to frighten them. You know, that fear of the dark develops in the next stage, which is the pre-operational stage between the ages of two to seven. So this is where the mental imagery really starts to develop. You know, they start to think about things that aren't right in front of them, but they can't really transform those mental images just yet. So they can recall things they've seen, but if it's not something they've personally seen, then it's just not going to work. They can't really handle those kinds of ideas. But as you, as you can imagine, as they get closer to that seven year mark, they do start to be able to manipulate their mental images to a greater and greater extent. Uh, this is also when children start to learn and master linguistic skills. But their thinking about one major aspect to this stage is that their thinking is still very intuitive and egocentric. So by intuitive, all I really mean here is that they're not using logic. They can't do logic at this point. They're still developing those logical reasoning skills. And as a result, they're easily tricked by illusions. Uh, uh, there's tons and tons of examples I could give you. Uh, you could do all kinds of little intuitive reasoning uh, tests to your child between the ages of two to seven to see if they're learning logical skills yet. There's there's videos about it. I'll, I'll post uh, some links to those videos in the description to this this one. But there are some really easy and fun ways to do these kinds of intuitive reasoning experiments. So I strongly recommend you try them yourself if you know anybody of this age. Another test you could do is to see if your child is thinking in an egocentric way. It's usually pretty obvious if your pre-operational stage child is egocentric, but there are tests for it, and I'll post a link for that as well. When I say egocentric, I just basically mean the child is incapable of understanding other people's perspective. You know, they're locked in their own perspective, and they just can't possibly understand how other people might be feeling or how other people might understand the world. So there's some really interesting things you can do for that too. <clears throat> now, whoops. Now the next stage is called the concrete operational stage, and that's between the ages of seven to eleven, approximately. You know, those preteen years. This is when children further develop that internal mental world. They start to develop things like logic and reason, and they can carry out more complicated mental operations, like such as reversibility. All I mean by that is if you take some object and you transform it in front of their face and they see you transform it, then they'll understand it can be transformed back again. Like that's just something that makes sense to them at this point. And while they do understand logic and they can use concepts like time and space and volume and number, they're still using them in very concrete ways. That's why we call it the concrete operational stage, because they can't really think about things in an abstract sense. They can only understand things that they can like see or touch. You know, concepts that don't have any real physical manifestation, concepts like love or justice or freedom, these, these are a bit too difficult for kids of this age to really appreciate. An appreciation for these more complicated abstract subjects comes later when they reach the fourth and final stage, which is the formal operational stage. So this is basically teenagers. You know, teenagers and older are in the formal operational stage, where now they can think about abstract principles and hypothetical possibilities. So those concepts that are removed from specific instances, you know, like justice and love, as I mentioned. But the other big aspect to the formal operational stage is the ability to think about hypotheticals, to understand cause-effect, to think about the future and speculate 
on how things will play out if they do certain actions. This is one of the big hallmarks of having an adult, like mature intellect, is being able to see the future in a manner of speaking. And this is where that begins to develop. So if you notice that your younger child is lacking the capabilities, like your six or seven year old just doesn't seem to understand that their actions are gonna have certain consequences, don't, don't be too upset about that. That just means they're, they're still learning. You know, these things do tend to happen at uh, certain periods of development. So just give it time. You know, by the time they reach their teenage years, they should start to develop those kinds of skills. <clears throat> but as a whole, when it comes to Piaget, these ideas are still very influential, as I mentioned. They, they haven't held up perfectly to scientific investigation, but a lot of science has been inspired by his research. And you'll see in the coming videos that most of these ideas, the core of these ideas, does seem to be fairly well supported.